Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to today's installment of Creative for More, the podcast. And today I'm exceptionally giddy. Oh, I've got a comic in the house. So I have to make sure that I bring my A game and I, I try to make you laugh. <laughs> Okay, so today's podcast is going to be fun. I have got a lady that I have just, you know, discovered. And I've been like, oh my gosh, she's so amazing. Why did it take me so long? Her name is Banke Awopatu. And she's also known as Banke the Author. Uh, also known as Banke the Author. And she's an explosive writer. Yes, you got that right. She's a stage performance. And she mesmerizes audiences with her contrast of stunning warmth to biting wit um, she's penned so far two novels always want more and the black um the uh, and new black which are stage productions film sitcom pilots and um she also do, has done marketing copy for hundreds of companies organizations and individuals including the food bank of new york city and the rochester city school district Banke is as electrifying on the stage as she is on the page um, she's a stand-up comedian as well and her stand-up has been featured on Hulu's Taste the Nation Banke I could That's go on funny. and on I could go on and on but look nothing beats hearing about you from you <laughs> So yes, I would ma'am. love, I would love, first of all, to welcome you to the show. So thank you so much for being here and taking time. Out My absolute pleasure. Coming on Creative for More, the podcast. I would love for you to introduce yourself to our audience. Who are you? What is the essence of you? Oh, you know, let, let's, let's meet you in the most unscripted format there is. Okay, well, again, thank you so much for having me on. I'm kind of obsessed with the UK. I have pictures of the UK on my vision board because I, yes, I believe I'm meant to come and perform there and uh, your audience is gonna kind of match me. But yeah, so, uh, and all the things that I do, words are the foundation. Um, I'm absolutely in love with the written and the spoken word. Mm -hmm. When I was a child, I was extremely introverted, mm -hmm. which I still am, but you know, we just, cover that side up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, really? That. <laughs> really? <laughs> that is um, some definition speak. of introversion. <laughs> I'm telling you, I didn't speak until I was three. And even then, I wouldn't talk a lot to my family. I would always kind of, they would find me under the stairwells, like hiding. Like I love to just listen to other people's conversations. So I would just say I'm a natural born storyteller. Um, my claim to fame when I was in elementary school is I would get, or primary school, um, I would get invited to sleepovers, which, you know, being Nigerian, I wasn't allowed to sleep over, but I could go for the evening portion, right? And everybody would want me to tell um, ghost stories. So I've just always just been this reservoir, like listening to words, collecting stories, and being able to tell them in various ways. Um, as an introvert, I love to read. The library is my absolute favorite place on the earth. So that's why, again, I have two novels. And when you pin something, when there's something on the page, like I can write something and then you, when you read it, you get your own experience, yes, your own interpretation. my own interpretation. Right? Yeah, so you kind of have that solitary experience, right? And then I have the solitary experience of writing it without, you know, your immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. When you're on the stage, it's the complete opposite. It's a communal experience, right? Mm -hmm. You know, laughter builds, you hear somebody laugh and then you might laugh too. And then as a performer, I can see in real time, like even now I can see you nodding. Mm -hmm. You have this, we're having this shared experience. So um, I can't say which one I prefer, whether, you know, the page or the stage. Uh, but they just, taking my first question away from me. <laughs> <laughs> they feed different parts of myself. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really interesting. At what point did you, uh, you know, because it's such a big step. I can, I can understand you tr going from, you know, being introverted and then writing because, as you say, you've this reservoir and you've taken in so much, and then you started writing. At what point did you then, you know, take the next step? Because being on stage is a, is a whole different kettle of fish, isn't it? It's a whole different thing. So. It's kind of like I transform. I have been performing spoken word poetry since a child. 
right? So again, you write the poems, you have that solitary experience, and then you actually deliver it. Like I kind of, not kind of, I did the poem at my high school graduation, things like that. But when I was in college, I studied theater and African, African American studies. And my goal at the time was to be a hip hop journalist. Like I wanted to write for the source, the double XL. These are all kind of like publications based in New York, but I was extremely shy. So I've always had like these close encounters. Like I'm one step away from the big interview. Like I had opportunities to interview Kanye West before anybody knew him. Oh, and I just, wow. he's you like just here and I'm here, I froze. Stop it. Same thing with Spike Lee, like all these things. And mm -hmm. so when I graduated, I didn't know what I was gonna do because it's like I didn't have uh, that go-getter, you know, uh, mentality to work with these hip hop publications, right? So I just moved back to my hometown and I started teaching English. So I would say it was in the classroom that that was the metamorphosis that I needed. Mm -hmm. but, and that was your I stage. Learned, that was my stage. Oh, wow. And I learned so much from my students because and I've, I've, I've always taught in urban areas, the hood. So you can't be shy or timid. And I also graduated from schools mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, and so this was my opportunity to create the type of classrooms I either had as a student or wish that I had. So there was no room to not speak. Like, you know, that's where I really develop my voice and everything that I do now, I truly learn how to do um, from my classroom experience. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I've never really thought about it like that because yes, in a sense, you're, you're entering into a persona and you are, you're delivering lines. For sure. <laughs> For a and no matter time. what, you have to maintain control. You have to be entertaining. People have short attention spans, right? Mm -hmm. In this day and age in education, you're teaching all different levels, ability, uh, what do you call it? Learning disabilities, perhaps. So I have to be able to switch it up, ha! Mm -hmm. you know? And all of those things serve me now. Mm, that's really, really interesting. And what is it like? I mean, how is it for you being a comic? Is it like a. Do you have to enter into a persona to do it? You know, is it like a Sasha Fierce, Beyonce thing? Right. Are you the yes. same person? Are you Banker mm. as is sitting here as the person who performs on stage? In the best instances, yes. Um, most comics, you know, they say it takes so long to develop your voice and your timing. But what it what it really takes is you being the funny person that you are on stage without any filter, right? So mm. my friends, my closest friends and family who know me, like I'm always gonna say this. I'm always gonna say the snarky thing that you're thinking, right? I'm like, I'm always been like the one liner. I've always been the person again because I was an introvert. But when I would say something, people were like, yo, like you're funny, I'm shocked, right? So in the beginning of my comedy career, I felt like I had to become a persona that was the wrong approach. Like mm. if I am my best and truest self on stage, that's when it always hits mm. the hardest. And how do you balance your personal values? Do you ever mm. have to enter into something that might be a little bit of a contradiction based on expectations of those around you mm. or the audience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so far, I just have said no to things. Um, mm. And even it's funnier because I was, I, I'm booked for a show tonight and it was kind of in a text conversation with the promoter of the show. And then I was telling myself, I just bite your tongue, don't say anything. Because that's been, uh, it can kind of be a hindrance when you're, you're too vocal. Um, I am a woman of faith, I am a follower of Christ. And I put it that way because I don't feel like I fit in a church box, mm. but my relationship with Christ is like, that's my guy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I love um, it. Yeah, so in talking about my faith on stage in places where, because I'm, I'm and I, let me be very clear, I'm a secular comic. Um, I love to curse. I feel like it keeps my teeth white. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'll talk about some of these things that are sins if you're not married, right? But then I will also talk about the fact that it is a sin. So it's like, I, for the most part, when I include any of my faith material, it alienates both sides. It alienates the secular community because they don't want to hear about Christ. Mm -hmm. And it alienates Christians because it's like, oh, you're not supposed to talk like that. Yeah. But it's like, I, 
the, the worst has come as you are. And so uh, until God changes certain things, then this is who I am. But I still love him in this moment. And he still loves me. Mm, so, so, so profound. I like that. Come as you are. You're literally just showing up the way you are. And, yeah. and, and it really, really speaks to, you know, being authentic in a space where, you know, there's expectations that, a lot of times people feel like they have to compromise mm. to to bend to the will of those around them so it's it's really really uh, good i think that you always compromise something it's just a matter of what you can compromise your values and perhaps you know get more popularity or whatever right mm -hmm. or you can uh, stay true to your values and then you compromise likability or whatever it's just a matter of what you can and cannot live with mm. you know yeah, it's a, it's 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 a really interesting dynamic. You compromise likability. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I was reading Yvonne Oje's book, Bamboozle. Oh, it's so good. By it's Jesus, so good. It is yes, so juicy. So Girl, me, I got a whole story on that. <laughs> Please tell me, tell me, tell me, tell okay. me. Okay, like, so. My, so I read the heart, I like books. I like mm. the, the yeah, whole the book, actual, right? yeah. um, the actual book. But my sister was absolutely in love with the audio book. And sometimes we do these sister reads, right? So I was rereading um, in regards to the audio book. And so I'm a part of this online ministry where we fast like the first three days of the month or whatever. So Yvonne Orji was coming into Houston to take uh, Hulu's Taste the Nation which is actually like a cooking, like food show. Um, and when, because they were based in Houston, they wanted to feature like Houston food, right? So they wanted to feature Suya and Houston is like a, a comedy hub. So they wanted to feature Nigerian comics Nigerian. as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So everybody who gets booked to be on the show, they're all more, way more established in the, the comedy scene than I am. They're all males and they're all evils. Right. Mm. And so I'm there just attending as a guest. Mm. But, you know, you know, her book says, you know, but I've been listening to her book during this fast because it's one of the few things that's kind of like it's entertaining and it's still like it is you know, so entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's so rich. Right. And so she's telling these stories about, you know, you don't got to um, get ready if you stay ready and how, you know, she would just speak up. And there was one particular story about how she was interning in this writer's room and then yes. on the spot. On the yes, spot, she was there. Yeah. yeah. And then how she had been, you know, so kind to everybody and kind of just really like a servant's mind, right? Mm -hmm. So when she had this opportunity to pitch or, you know, share her input, how everybody went crazy. Everybody in the room was rooting for her because she had been serving them all day, mm -hmm. right? Okay, cool. So I get to the shooting um, and at the time I was still teaching full time, right? So I had been at work all day. Uh, I had, I just packed like a fly on Kyra outfit in my bag so I could transform once I got there. And anything that anybody needed, I was like, oh, you know, just serving everybody. I'm cool with the production assistants. I'm just chilling. Mind you, I'm there as an audience member, mm -hmm. right? So the show starts and all the guys, they get up and they do their thing. And one of them was really good, right? Um, but she was like, so, excuse me, Yvonne Orji opened the show. She did her set, mm -hmm. and it was really cool because it was like new material, right? So it was kind mm -hmm. of her like workshop and get and mm -hmm. get to have this experience. Same, and testing, testing out the material. And, mm -hmm. Right, but you know, when you, and that's you know, an insider for your audience, all these comedy specials, everybody who's there is like, you are instructed to laugh no matter what. <laughs> stop it, stop it, you ruined yes. it for me. Are you being serious? Serious. That there's a sign at the top that says laugh now. Not laugh now, but when you come in, it's you, you're you just, you know that you're being filmed too. So mm -hmm. laugh, laugh as, you know, boisterous as you can. That's why I don't know if you ever watched a comedy special. You're like, it's not really that funny, but everybody's cracking up. It and happens also, to me all the time. When I'm watching, I don't want to name names, but when I'm watching certain yeah. like comics that are, you know, known and, and, and they're saying stuff and I'm like, it's not that funny. <laughs> and then you see the audience and, and everyone up. is cracking up. And sometimes you might laugh too because laughter is contagious. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes in those specials too, they either gave those tickets away so that you can make sure that the place was packed mm -hmm. and or they paid them to come. Stop it. No lie. 
So anyway, so so we've all been instructed to laugh, and her material is actually funny. So we're mm-hmm. laughing anyway, right? So she does her thing. Um, she's you know on her phone, probably you know doing business or whatever. So the first guy who blows up after her, these are like you know the Houston comics, right? Or the comics who are based in Houston, I should say. So he was the funniest, but she wasn't watching him. Like, mm-hmm. and again, how God's timing works, right? The guy who goes second, he's eh, he's okay. Mm-hmm. The guy who goes third, and you know, the headliner, the, the last person is supposed to be the best. Now at this point, when he goes, this is how God works. The, the production people sat Yvonne right next to me. So for the second and third comic, and again, we're all instructed to laugh. So, you know, we go, ah, I don't know how you laugh. Hey, girl. So me and her are doing this the mm-hmm. whole time. When the third guy goes up, I told you, he wasn't that strong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she was a very, you know, Nigerian, she's pretty transparent. Mm-hmm. So she kind of... Side eyed. Side eye. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, y'all should have had me on this show, right? So when it's over, the Holy Spirit is telling me the whole time, I'm sitting next to her, say something, say something, say something. But the introvert in me is like, but there's something in her book, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing what she says, it's better to regret having done something versus not doing it. Than not doing it, right? yeah. Yeah, so they literally start packing up all the camera equipment, all the lights. And she's like, okay, can all the comics get on stage to take a picture? So then I say, all the comics who perform or all the comics who are here? And she's like, you're a comic? And I was like, yeah, besides you, the only Nigerian woman comic who's here. And she was like, well, why didn't you perform? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm ready now. So her and the host of the show, who was Pat Malashmi, who's like very like well known in the food industry, she's Pakistani, they're pissed. They look at each other and then they turn to the producers. We asked for a woman. Now everybody starts to, uh, 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 uh. you know what Yvonne says? Get her mic. Whoa. They they plug the lights back up. They set everything up. They're miking me. And she says, you better be funny. Right like this to me. And I said, mm, no problem. I am. Killed it. Oh, I couldn't my. have planned it. Nothing but the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Because the whole time when I, like I said, I came prepared. I had my change of clothes. I'm serving everybody. I knew that God was going to do something. I just didn't know. You just didn't know how. I didn't know how. Oh and then this God. is something I've been working on um, in my dating life. Because, again, the word says, asking you shall receive. So mm-hmm. I used to always feel like I shouldn't have to ask these guys for particular things. Right? But if I had to, even the, the host of hosts, the king of kings, requires us to ask. Does God not know what we need? Mm-hmm. And we have to ask God. We have to ask anybody for whatever we need. Whether it's a, a career opportunity, whether it's romance, you have to open your mouth and speak. Sis, you're preaching. You are preaching to my soul. Mm. You are preaching to my soul. There's just so many powerful moments in the story that you shared that I, I'm just like, gosh, how do we even start to deconstruct this? It's not over until it's over. Mm. You know, at that point where you spoke, mm. You could have thought it's over. She's just speak. She's just speaking to the comics in the room. It's just the people who performed. I'm just gonna keep quiet. So even if you didn't say anything all through, at that last minute, it was still important that you spoke. And and it speaks to this whole thing where people feel like you know what? I've missed my opportunity. I've lost mm. my chance. I had there. I was sat with Yvonne OG the whole night, but I didn't say anything. And you know, you can always speak. Please just talk about why it's important to take the chances the minute you realize that, you know what, this is my moment, whether or not you feel it's late. Because as she said, um, nothing is worse than regret, you know? And when I look back at my own life, there's very few things that I've done that I regret. It's all the chances that I didn't take, you know? Again, Kanye West being four or five feet away from me and I have a press pass on. I've been granted this access and I still won't say, can I ask you a few questions, right? I didn't, I couldn't go home with that feeling again. I couldn't go and tell my sister, oh, I sat next to Yvonne Orgy for over an hour 
and I didn't say anything. Like I just couldn't mm. do it. And then also, like I said, I was fasting during that time, right? Mm. So you know, what does the word say? Like some demons don't leave unless through prayer mm. and fasting, and fasting, right? And, fasting. and I have been listening to her words, so I knew from that experience that she shared. This is something that she would respect, mm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and how would you say, I, I want to talk about that moment, that moment where you were, you know, four feet away from Kanye West. You know, what was that thing that held you back? And mm. what was that thing that, as you say, you had a press pass on, he was right there, you had access, you've been given <laughs> access. Right. What held you back and what do you feel holds a lot of people back from stepping into what they've been given by God? Yeah, fear. And to be specific, the fear of doing too much, the mm -hmm. fear of rejection. You know, I was thinking, well, he just performed. Maybe he doesn't want to be bothered. Um, I also came with like two other people who they were very shy. Like I didn't want to break out of the pack and like, like, I, again, I was doing too much. Like, I thought I was, like, I was better than them. Like, I was, you know, that would have required me to take an action that nobody who was backstage was taking. Mm. And I didn't want that attention. I didn't want, I was afraid of how that would be construed. Would mm. I seem like I thought I was all that? You know? and, and, and these arguments are so convincing, aren't they? I was reading, I'm yeah. reading this book, um, The War of Art by Stevens Prescott mm. and it talks mm. about the concept the war of, of art of art it's a great book oh my gosh you should read it and he talks about this concept of, of resistance and how resistance is the enemy of creation it's the thing that stops us from doing anything that we ever want it's the thing that stands between us and living our dream lives right mm. and how resistant speaks to us and makes such a convincing argument mm. that it sounds good it smells good it makes sense it just came off of stage you know i don't want to bother him i'm being thoughtful i'm being kind you know it almost sounds like the excuse that the master the the the, the servants in the parable of the talent you know the mm. servant that didn't do anything mm. It yeah, you played good. Safe. Yeah, but right. it, it was it was a good argument, right? I didn't want right. to I didn't want to spend your money. I wanted to make sure that I know I, you are a hard man. <laughs> right. You know, I wanted to make sure, you know, I'm thinking about you, Kanye. I want to make sure that you're good. You're not disturbed and 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 you know, I don't want to step out of line. I don't want you to think about me as rude or, you know, you know all of that. And and we have these arguments in our head. And it's like how do we in that moment, obviously now in hindsight you can look back. But how did you no, like in the when you had another opportunity with Yvonne that this wasn't right like you know what I have to break out this isn't about her this is about me and this being my moment to to, to, to step out I don't care if they have to turn on all the lights and, and whatever I don't care if I inconvenience this isn't before you were thinking about okay I don't want he might be tired this is like I am I am actually causing a scene here right? i'm disrupting the production disrupting for sure everything yeah yeah it was, again the, it wasn't me it wasn't me it was the holy spirit um and how she received me was the holy spirit right and in that moment when she said get her mic the entire room erupted in applause because like i said i had been serving the production assistants right and there were other comics who were sitting right next to me other women comics but they were black american and even as i was you know oh, i'm the only nigerian com woman comic here besides you i still had that stepping out is it fair you mm -hmm. know how would that be perceived all mm -hmm. of these various things but i and who knows how they i believe they truly perceived it the way they the exterior show it was nothing but happiness and appreciation some of them guys, one of them in particular, you know, I said, he was, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. I kind of got a, got a side eye, but it's like, That's, uh, you know, 
I know Yvonne's story because I read it about how, you know, her story was just so deep around how, you know, her family went against her. You know, people weren't speaking to her because she was just going against convention. She wasn't being a doctor. She wasn't doing all of that. What is your story around mm. doing comedy? Because I know it's not it's it's not something that people you know people particularly where we're from <laughs> mm -hmm. have expectations yeah. or high expectations around you know we know what we're expected to do doctor lawyer you know engineer engineer mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to if you want to be if you be a bit, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it you know what what's been what is what's the journey been like for you um, fortunately for me, I'm the last born, so mm -hmm. I think we get like uh, liberties that our older siblings do not. And also fortunately for me, I'm both Black American and Nigerian, so I joke and say I'm a green card baby, right? So my mother, <laughs> literally, well, I guess literally my older sister is a green card baby. It was love by the time I came around. But anyway, um, so I... And I just don't, I don't know how you guys have done it, having two Nigerian parents. That would be too much. Like, just having I... one was like... <laughs> That's funny. It was a lot, so, actually. <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, you know, growing up, you know, with y'all was here, you know, math and science is most important. And, you know, my siblings were all good at all those traditional things. Um, but my strong point has always been words. Like, from a child, whenever you ask, like, what do you want to do? I always said a writer. There was a period for like a good two or three years where I would say a doctor. And she talks about this in her book too, just because mm. that's the, what you're supposed to say. Yeah, that's it's what you're supposed the, to say. Yeah. And all the adults, the reaction they have when you say that. Um, but it's just been a talent that has been so apparent that it was undeniable, you know, in mm. regards to, at the time, you know, the written word. Um, when my older siblings and you know the closest age is four years, they would ask me to write their papers for them. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like uh, my mother has always been incredibly supportive, and my father in recent years is I, would I say supportive? I don't know if I would say supportive, but I would say he's not resistant anymore. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Okay. And um, what has it been like in the industry itself? Because it's 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 not come on, it's not very welcoming, even to uh, to anybody. It's cutthroat, right? You're there. We either laugh or you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What what has it been like for you? Just walking that road, and 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 where do you see yourself going? At this point, because everything in my career and life is, I've never quite fit into the box, mm. right? You know, having these dual identities of being Black American and Nigerian. And like I said, I grew up in the hood, so it was like, you know, you're an African booty scratcher, you're this, you're that, mm. right? And then when I got to college and started to meet, you know, other Nigerians my age, and it was, oh, you're not Nigerian enough, you know, you don't speak Yoruba or Pigeon or whatever. So it's always kind of been like this otherness, right? Um, in regards to me as a novelist, my style is equally influenced by hip hop as it is classic black literature, right? Mm. So I am a, and I say disciple, not in a religious context, but I'm a disciple of Maya Angelou. Like I know mm. her story forwards and backwards, right? And she was this hybrid performer, you know? a poet, a dancer, an activist, an organizer, she, an educator. She did all of these things. She did them all incredibly well. Um, I'm a disciple of Nipsey Hussle, you know, um, who was Eritrean and Black American and kind of had this unorthodox, you know, uh, way to reach his audience without going through a major uh, record company. You know what I mean? So James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, Chimamanda Adichie Nabusi, mm -hmm. um, Coral Cleach, uh, Tupac, uh, Biggie, Nicki Minaj, like these are, they're all equally my influences. So mm -hmm. when I put out my first novel, I spent three years trying to get an agent and go the traditional publishing route. 
because at the time I was still, this was me, this is my first step, me stepping into my current self. You know, okay, I'm a teacher. I've always written, let me write this novel. I still can be an introvert. And I wanted an agent and a traditional publisher so that they would do all the extroverted stuff yeah. for me, right? Yeah. I spent three years trying to get an agent and uh, fortunately I got all no's. Some of them were generous no's and that they took the time to explain why. And they were like- Generous no's. <laughs> generous no's. And they were like, your style doesn't fit into the urban fiction box. Because mm -hmm. at, by this time, people are considering urban fiction to be Baby Mama Drama Part 3 or whatever books you see at Walmart or whatever, right? And they said, and it doesn't fit into the mainstream literary box. Mm -hmm. So it was like I was in between. Mm -hmm. So at one point I had just gave up on it. I'm like, oh, okay, God, I guess I'm just meant to teach and live this, you know, humble life. And I had met with a financial advisor and he was asking me, you know, do you have any other assets or ways you could, you know, generate money? I'm like, oh, well, I wrote this book, but I can't get it published. And then I kind of told him the story. He was like, that's a good thing. That means that nobody has done what you've done. Mm. Oof. That's a great perspective. That's a great perspective. So you're a trailblazer. You're, you're creating the road for somebody else. Hmm. For sure. And just like you spy, that's the, cause you know, that's, a, that's, I don't, I'm not gonna, it's heavy at times, hmm. right? Um, when there's no reference point, when people haven't seen it before. And so I use Kickstarter to raise the money, the publishing fees, because I'm like, okay, again, I'm a lover of books. So it's like, I couldn't just, and you know, no shade to anybody, just to put together some Amazon thing. Like, no, my book needs to look, smell, mm. feel like the the books with millions of dollars behind them, mm. you know? Um, and in doing that, I share chapters with women like us, you know, women who are coming from backgrounds I'm coming from, who are, at the time I was calling it hood elegant, you know? You may be from these urban communities and you have that rough edge and you speak slang and, and if it's a problem, you can handle it. And you're also educated, you're also sophisticated, you're also cultured, you know? Nobody was really writing to women like us. Like all of us read this book in high school, and when I say all of us, I mean like my generation mm -hmm. and that particular type of woman mm -hmm. I'm describing, and it was called The Coldest Winter Ever. And everybody, by Sister Soldier, everybody absolutely loved this book, kind of changed your life. But after that, there was nobody who was again writing in that, you know, in that mm -hmm. space. And so when I was sharing chapters with people as I was raising the Kickstarter money, it was like, yo. So yeah, so we we did well. <laughs> we did well. And from that initial success in the town that I'm from in upstate New York, um, I got covered by every local publication, um, oh, wow. print, press, everybody. And then my, uh, the first novel was focusing it was like the urban coming of age story, but told from the teacher's perspective, mm. right? Um, excuse me. So, of course, it's talking about some of the things that are needed in education reform, some of the, you know, the ills of the current um, system. And then so universities started bringing me in to speak to, you know, the students who were in their education departments to speak to future teachers. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And I will say to this day, my strongest network has been my former students because my first uh, speaking opportunity at a university, um, one of my former students, I taught her in high school and she was in their department and the professors were talking and she was like, I don't know anything. You need to bring my teacher in here to speak. Oh, wow. And, and then they did. Oh my God, that's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. So it's like all of our steps are lined up. For the longest time, I felt like I had lost time. You know, and I, you know, as women, we have biological clocks. So I feel like we're just more mindful of time than men are, right? Mm. And you feel like, oh wow, that was a waste, or that was a detour, or whatever. Even you think about like in the Bible, and the world, you know, the Israelis how they like spent forty so, years yeah. in the wilderness, but that forty-year period was needed. You know what I mean? So it's really believing that 
our steps are ordered and all things mm. work for our good. All you things know? really do work all together. things. Oh, good. Yeah. For sure. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. And and and, and was that what, what did you do for your second book? So you've got two, don't you? Yes, I do. So the second book uh, is kind of a, a sad story, but again, all things work for our good. So at this point, I've generated enough uh, interest. I have an investor who's going to put all the money up. And this time when it comes to self-publishing, I'm, I'm paying for expanded distribution. So that means if anybody goes to a Barnes & Noble or orders from Amazon or whatever, that the book is already there. <clears throat> Whereas the first time I did print on demand. So if you went to a Barnes & Noble to look for my book, okay, they'll say, okay, we'll, we'll ship it to you. We need like two or three days. Mm -hmm. So they will only print them as somebody As paid. somebody you know what I mean? Somebody paid. But couldn't you go on the success of the first book to get someone to support you for the second one? At this point, I'm like, I'm just going to do it independent. Uh, okay. and, and again, being so influenced by hip hop, you know, I'm like, okay, we're just going to keep doing it this way. Um, but now, though, I'm able to pay the printer and, and their distributor companies too. I can pay them all this money up front. So the process is the same, even if I had a traditional publisher. Because once I started to research, most authors, most books, only 3% will sell more than a thousand copies. Three percent. Three percent. Now, of course, you have these major bestsellers, and so people think like, but that's not. Oh, excuse me, that's not the experience for most authors and most books. But if you have a traditional publishing contract, you're paying for all the marketing. They take that out of your cut, right? Mm -hmm. And most likely, you're not going to sell more than a thousand. So it's like, okay, if I have to pay for all the marketing and put myself out there, why am I splitting my money with you? Mm -hmm. I might as well just do it myself. So now I have an investor. She's been around for two or three years. Like, it's all good. You know, I have this company I've already worked with. Well, two major things happened. Um, one, the company was sold. And whoever bought it, that it was not the same quality. And also, they were super conservative, like, alt-right type of people. Um, and these are all euphemisms for racists. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. So already the quality, the communication, mm. everything is down. And when you have a publisher, you have to trust that when your books are selling, mm -hmm. they're giving you the right numbers, the right royalties. So I'm looking like, I don't mm. know about this, but I've already paid, right? Oh dear. And then my investor, this is, uh, this is when the pandemic hit. So I'm not sure how the pandemic was in the UK, but you know, in the States, Every state is its own government. They do different things. So on the East Coast and on the West Coast, they had like real shutdowns. Mm -hmm. In the South, there was no shutdown. Not really. Oh, wow. Okay. A pseudo in the, in shutdown. the UK, it was everything, like the entire United Kingdom. Yeah. No. Not here. So, um, yeah, so I was still going out, still living my life. And, you know, during that time, it was very, in the States, it was very polarized in regards to, this was even prior to vaccinations. That was a whole nother polarization. But, and it, that's the country being divided because again, the liberal states, the democratic states are shut down. The Republican states are wide open. It was like Mardi Gras, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my investor, she lived in New York City and you know that, you know, New York City got slammed. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing, you know, all these corpses. It's, it's, it's very, it's very tragic, but that wasn't our reality here. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she told me, and I, this is a direct quote, that I was exhibiting a disturbing lack of empathy. Oh, dear. And she's like, and she's like, all these years I've known you, you know, you, you present yourself as you're a woman of faith. And, and I just can't believe you would not shut down. And she was like, and you think, and she wasn't a believer. She was like, people like you are the reason why this is spreading. And you guys think that God is going to save you. And that's not how science works. So she pulled her money out. Mm -hmm. So it was a double blow. This I've already paid my money towards mm -hmm. this publisher that is not legit. And she's pulling her money out. This is, and mm -hmm. beyond her pulling the money out, I had a relationship with her since the first book. Um, and so I'm like, okay. But like I said, I'm a disciple of Nipsey Hussle. So he ran this campaign where he allowed for his fans, you know, because he always had a very loyal fan base. They could either go on a different streaming 
sites and get the, his music completely free, this one particular album, or they could pay $100 for the physical copy. Mm. And it was called Proud to Pay. You know, it was like, you know, you can have it for free. I'm giving it to you. But if you support me and my movement, and then also it was like the bragging rights of being one of the few people, because it was only a limited amount of these physical CDs. Mm. Well, me, I had a limited amount of the books printed, right? I just had the distributor send them all to me, but I didn't trust them to distribute them. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to do what Nipsey Hussle did. And we're going to sell these books for $100 a pop. And that's what we did. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. So what, what what did that teach you about faith and, and mm. yourself? What did that teach you? Uh, that experience? Uh, well, it taught me, because in hindsight, I feel like I could have done more to have a conversation with the woman who was my investor, you know? Mm. When she hit me with the, oh, you're supposed to be Christian, like, I just kind of shut down and was like, mm. all right, whatever. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but, and I did have empathy and understanding because her reality in New York City was completely different than mine. But I was not keen to my faith being questioned like that, especially by a non-believer. Like you're just looking for a reason. You mm. know what I mean? Um, but I think, you know, in hindsight and having just matured more that we could have actually and even if the result wasn't the same, I just, I don't think it's, if you have an opportunity as a believer um, and somebody is criticizing or questioning, I mean, we are supposed to be disciples of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I could have taken an additional step. Um, in regards to the plan and putting it out there, it was a matter of faith, but it was also a matter of me having confidence in my brand mm -hmm. and that I built it to a point where people know my words are worth a hundred dollars and more mm. right um and then having this template that nipsey gave i just followed it the same way like if you go to bonkaytheauthor.com you can get the ebook and it's a real ebook because again i want everything is comparable to mm. a major publishing house right you can get it for completely for free and if you want to support my movement and have this physical copy and it's it's prayed over, it's signed, it comes beautifully wrapped. If you want that experience, then it's a hundred dollars. And I don't budge on it. You know, people have been like, oh, why don't you? No, because I know my worth, you know? Mm. Um, and it was during that time that I started doing stand up comedy because although we didn't have a real shutdown, the platforms that I was using for creative outlets, you know, it's this book that I have to be very creative about because of the situation, right? And even as we're doing book releases, you know, I wanted to be mindful and so everything was socially distant. So we would just have these like a whole bunch of micro releases, like no more than 20 people in the space, you know? Mm -hmm. So just doing those. Um, and then I was used to being able to go and perform spoken word poetry. But those places <clears throat> weren't really um open and operating during that time but stand-up comedy was every day because no matter what people need to laugh people wanted to laugh and then i was people needed to mm. and i'm like well i'm funny you know i already <laughs> <laughs> i already know how to write right um the the, the setup for jokes is it's a frame that you can learn um i'm not afraid um i kind of hit rock bottom in this thing that i had been preparing for this release of New Black, the second novel, we have been preparing me and this woman for three years for this, right? Um, and so I'm like, well, why not? Within a month of me starting, I started to get gay gigs. Artistically, professionally, nothing has opened to me as easily as comedy has. Oh, wow. That and is again, your experience. That's because my people, experience. people have it. I mean, when you hear about you know the experiences of people, you know, in comedy, it, it's never very rosy. You always hear about how they try, they push, they da da da. da. So, what does that tell you about purpose? Do you feel like maybe you know what? What does that tell you about your your own kind of your, your purpose and, and, and go that to all life? things add up, right? Because even with the Avad Orgy situation. I got my first TV credit. Even you, you read that on the bio. Mm -hmm, I was just mm -hmm, featuring mm -hmm. a Hulu Taste the Nation. Mm -hmm. That was within my first 18 months of doing comedy. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
And so again, I say this for everybody listening. Um, I'm turning 39 next week. Um, you're never too old. It's never too late. There are, God's plan is perfect. All those things that, you know, those different directions that you took, it all comes together. You know, I have this confidence on stage. I had this confidence in doing comedy because I was what I was 20 when that Kanye West thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can't tell me anything now. And the truth is, like I said, I was afraid of, you know, people, of me, you know, inconveniencing people or people thinking that I was cocky or whatever. Mm. Well, the truth is I am cocky. Mm. Um, and for years, mm. right, I tried to cover that, you know? Mm. That's why I said, you know, when I am myself on stage, it's always a win. It's only when I'm trying to, you know, temper myself, you know, that it's a problem. And that happens, you know, few and far between. So good, so good. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. I, as we start to close, I want to ask you to paint a picture for us of your um, 50 year old self. What do you see? Mm. Mm. I think, one, I think that 40 is going to be a turning point for me. Mm. And because a lot of the women artists, that I study, again, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Tina Turner, they got their big breaks after 40. Mm -hmm. And in the West, and especially with women, we're youth obsessed. And you think if you haven't done these things by 40, it's over for you. I feel like everything that God has for me is over that 40 bridge. Mm -hmm. um, so at 50, um, I will be a bestseller. I will be a bestselling author. Um, and that's going to open all the doors. Will I still want to perform stand-up comedy? I don't know. I know that I enjoy it now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gearing up next month. I'm doing a comedy cabaret. So I'm blending all the forms that I love. Comedy and spoken word and dance and skits. And so it's everything I've learned as a writer and performer in one show. Um, I want to do more of that. Like I see myself having a show in Vegas. Um, again, I feel like the UK is going to be integral in my development. I don't know how or why. This year when I made my vision board, you know, I had just really been inspired by the things I was learning and reading um, to just just do put as much big stuff on there. Like, don't try to do the the logical oh, or the practical. Yeah, don't limit yourself. Just, just put it out there. Just put it out there. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking for these pictures of London. Like it was calling to me. I'm like, the exchange rate is not in our favor. <laughs> like, why am I thinking London? I don't know. I don't know. And then when you reached out, right? Oh, wow. Oh wow, London is calling. <laughs> we'll receive you, come. Yes, 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 yes. I don't know if I know of any black comics that are established properly in the UK that are women that are Nigerian. Oh, there's a space that is, there's a gaping hole. <laughs> There is a gaping hole, so definitely. Yeah, and you can't be afraid of opportunities. So when I got your message, I'm like, okay, and you're so, and even, you know, you're completely lovely, you know, like mm -hmm. your your radiance and your, your passion for what you're doing and sharing these stories, mm -hmm. it came across in the message that you sent me, you know? And then, you know, part of me was like, okay, that's why I was like, don't send me no attachments. I know you was a, a Yahoo <laughs> Yahoo girl. Wow. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but it look like, okay, say yes to this, you know? Aww. Well, I'm glad you said yes. I am glad you said yes because I've been, I've been thoroughly blessed by this conversation. Um, I want to, I want to speak about the parts that hit me the most. When you talked about turning forty, I've just turned forty. Mm. 
Happy birthday! <laughs> yeah, so me and Brad, Brad are there, my friend, we turned 40 on the same day in September. And, um, you know, there's always that feeling, right? That, you know what, am I late? Am I coming to, is this it? You know, you know, yeah. when you're, you're 30 and you're looking at your, your vision, you know, your vision board. When I'm 40, I'll do all of these things. And there's always that yeah. feeling in the heart. Like, have I reached, is this what I thought I would be at 40? So the, the, I had that a little bit, not too much, but thankfully because mm. obviously I, I'm a woman of faith and you know I'm doing mm. a lot of stuff already as is but obviously there's more um, but that was very reassuring and I'm hoping that you know everyone listening takes that no matter what age you are you know it's never too late um, the lesson that you shared at the beginning from Yvonne Elgin's story was so powerful so powerful the fact that even at the 11th hour the, the mm. dying minute you still spoke up make sure mm. um and this is me just speaking to the audience now just make sure that you know if you feel it in your heart don't feel like it's too mm. late just step into that feeling on that moment and, and 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 speak up speak up you either get a yes or a no that's that's the worst that can happen that's the worst that can happen, <laughs> yep. that can happen. so uh, you know i'm hoping that this is um this conversation you know with this conversation you feel empowered to always speak your mind and and i think with that, i want I, I want i want to just ask as we as we close just the importance of you know us using our voices um I, and, and i know obviously you use it on the stage you know in a sense but how important is this for us to speak? I, I, I'm going back to this point with, with you know, with Kanye, and I think I, we've dealt with it, but there's something in there that hasn't gone, hasn't left me, and 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 I feel that there's something in there for somebody. You talked about how you felt held back by fear, you didn't want to, you know, inconvenience people, and because we we put all these excuses, but how important is it that you know? someone listening to this podcast who feels like you know what i have no power in my voice mm. is it important for them to use their voice how does that help them you know in terms of their usefulness here on earth i, I, I don't have another way to ask the question yeah um get it. god created the world through words mm. god mm. had to speak yes. God had to speak, right? And again, the scripture says, ask and you shall receive. That's what God requires of us. So anything that is for us, any blessing that God has for us and all the ways that God wants us to bless others, hmm. it requires you to speak. There is no going around it. I think that for one, you have to forgive yourself for all the times you didn't speak hmm. and understand that as women, We've been conditioned to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, even if you think historically, evolution-wise, right? Like women, we have been in, we've been physically vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, we're smaller or are not as physically we're strong not as, physically as men. physically strong, yes. Right, so we've been at their mercy, right? Mm -hmm. And so as women, we've learned our collective, we've learned to always be watching you know, have this super awareness, this self-consciousness, right? Because we had to be that way for our own physical safety. You couldn't ruffle any feathers because you could you could be killed, right? Mm -hmm. And we know in some societies, women are still as physically vulnerable, mm -hmm. so they still have to constantly mask. They can't speak, right? Mm -hmm. If you are in a position and you're blessed enough to where that physical vulnerability is, that's no longer the case, you don't have to worry about somebody backhanding you or you know them or them burning you in your sleep or whatever these worst things that happen, right? You don't have to worry about that. Then now, not only do you need to speak for yourself, it's your duty because mm -hmm. some women literally cannot speak. Mm -hmm. So how dare you be in this position of privilege where you don't have to worry about your physical safety as a result of the things that you say, you better open your mouth. You mm -hmm. have to. For me, journaling, I journal every day, first thing in the morning before I cut my phone on, three pages. So it's- Three pages, not three sentences, three pages. Three pages, oh. three pages. 
no matter what. Even today, when I got to the second page, I'm like, God, I don't really know what else to say. All right, that's it. Guess I'm just gonna keep writing. And then what I really think will come out. Because if you can't, at least within your, to yourself, say how you truly feel about things, now what you're supposed to say. If your kid is getting on your last nerve, I'm sick of this kid. I wish I, I don't I made a mistake. I don't even know why I had this mobile. Mm -hmm. At least you can say it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. At least you can say that to yourself, right? Just having having that clarity. Now when I'm dating, well, I'm asking for what I want. And again, some of the things that you truly want most, the things that you really, 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 really want, most people are not going to be in agreement. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Because the few that are, mm -hmm. you're not looking for the majority. You're looking for your tribe. Yes. I know my audience are these hood elegant women. Like look at like look at if I had came here and I tried to speak like for everybody, we wouldn't be having this level of connection, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You won't reach anybody like that. You yeah. know? You try to reach everybody, you'll hit nobody. You hit nobody. You speak and you own your truth first and foremost. Mm-hmm then mm -hmm. everything else is possible. Mm -hmm. And it may be a steeper climb, it may be a longer climb, but the view is beautiful, it's yours. Mm -hmm. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I love when you talked about um, the book also about creating your own category. I, I don't think you use those words exactly, but right. you know, and, and the importance of that, I, I, I'm just emphasizing is that is the fact that sometimes some dreams that you've been given it won't it won't be a smooth path you will have to create you will have to forge a path a path to where you want to go and and a lot of people i, I don't know if it's just a generational thing but people i i i just not predisposed to doing hard work anymore mm. now i want to push back on that a little bit because I don't think it's a matter of hard work. I think it's a matter of your work. Mm. You know, you are up. So now it's 11 p.m. your time. Yes, it is. Right? Mm -hmm. We can look at that as hard work. But it's your work. You're actually energized by this. Did you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, I am. I get energy. You know? I literally take energy off of these conversations. Right. So I don't think, I think when we're aligned, you know, it, it takes time. It takes effort. You know, we have to, you have to do, it takes action. I don't think it's hard, you know? Mm. So it's is, not is, hard is, for is, is that, is, is that a telltale sign though? If it feels hard, then maybe it's not, an, you're not in an alignment. For sure. For sure. Mm. And again, it will take time, it will take effort, it will take, you know, focused energy. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's what we really want to call it, focused energy. But when it's your work, that focused energy feeds you more than it depletes you. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how you know. Across the board, relationships, careers, anything you're doing, again, it's going to take that focused energy. Mm -hmm. Cool. But how do you feel during and after? Hmm. So good. So so good. God, I enjoy this this energized me, boy. Me <laughs> that is good. This really energized me. Thank you so much for coming My here. Coming on. pleasure. Thank you for bringing your full self, authentic self. Thank you, Thank you for um, receiving me. Yes, yes. I enjoyed speaking with you from my heart and connecting with you. And I know I have no doubt that our audience or my audience have been thoroughly blessed by this. And I look forward to that vision coming to fruition. Yes. What you painted, Amen. had everything, we'll write it down, stick it on the wall somewhere for you and okay. and, 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 and and say, hey, you said it. I'll bring out this video later. I'll be like, hey, what? Yeah, this? for sure. She's famous now. Hey, look <laughs> when I interviewed her. <laughs> and when I come to the UK, yes. when we take our selfie together. Look yes. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely lovely to meet you. And thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you.